uh, let's get started with the talk. Um, this is actually going to be more than just a talk and probably a fitting end to the Congress. Uh, so we have Capayod, who is going to give a live demonstration of the security vulnerabilities of the real-time transport protocol. And he has a live setup here, which, which is pretty much going to be his talk. His talk is going to be a demonstration of the kind of vulnerabilities that the protocol is prone to. So yes, let's begin the talk, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Um, um, my talk will mainly focus on the demonstration part. At the first, I will be giving this some overview about RTP and for what it's used and uh, what might be the problems with it. And the demonstration will focus on uh, the asterisk open source PBX because for like the last eight to nine years, that's what I've been doing from day to day. But I've also tested this with different other open source implementations and will say a few things about that. So that's just the overview. We just dive into a very short introduction to RTP. It expands to the real-time transport protocol. Um, the first uh, version was RFC 1889, and that's the, the recent version is uh, RFC 3550. Just if you want to take a look yourself at the specification and, and see what's in there. Basically, it's, it's just used to transfer multimedia streams, maybe audio or video, uh, over an IP network, usually using UDP as a transport layer for that. And because networks, especially like the internet or wide area networks, are a lossy and support that uh, uh, packets may go to, to the same destination over different routes, um, they have uh, added support for reordering of packets by using sequence numbers and also, the RTP uh, conveys the timing of the sender to the receiver, so it can basically synchronize to the, to the clock of the sender and then sample the audio or the video and then play it back. It's mainly used uh, nowadays with uh, voice of IP signaling protocols, H323 or SIP, which is probably like 90% uh, of what is being used today, but also other protocols like MGCP, and I also think uh, SCCP from Cisco is also using RTP. So it's very common. It's basically what is used in, in most cases when people are using internet telephony over the public internet or just private networks. And actually, it's, it's, it's two protocols. It's RTP, the real-time transport protocol, and RTCP, the real-time transport control protocol. But most people just refer to both protocols by well, we're using RTP, they say. And uh, the specification says that RTP usually runs on an even-numbered port, and the RTCP uh, usually runs on the next higher odd-numbered port. But that, I think that's uh, not required anymore with the new version, but uh, it's a very good idea to do it so your implementation is backwards compatible with, with old implementations. So if we look at an RTP packet, um, basically it's just an IP packet with a UDP header inside, and then we get uh, at least 12 octets of the RTP header. Um, I'll just go over it very quickly. Basically, you have a version number, which can be 0, 1, or 2. 2 is the actual version that is used. Uh, RTP version 1 has been not really used, and there are no plans for, for a new version of that. Um, then you have some indicators like if there is any padding applied to the, to the packet, what type of payload the packet contains that usually is, um, it is defined by uh, different uh, profiles of RTP. The main profile that is used is the audio video profile, AVP, or the secure audio video profile when you're using uh, secure RTP. Then we get to the interesting stuff that's uh, a sequence number so you can reorder packets if they arrive in a different order. It's just a 16-bit counter, which will also wrap quite, quite often. And um, the, the payload that is contained in the packet, the first octet of the payload has been sampled at the sender at, at this timestamp, which is a 32-bit value. Um, it's a good practice to, when you start a new RTP session, to uh, use a random value for the timestamp and the sequence number. 
um, uh, to work against uh, plain text attacks when you're using SRTP. You already got a question? Um, it, it, for example, if you're using a G711, then you have like, it depends on the, on the sampling rate you have, but usually you're using eight kilohertz, and then you have like 8,000 bytes per second, and every byte of that is, is one increment to this uh, timestamp. So it, for um, audio, it wraps, I don't know, um, not that often, but if you have a, a video application, it will wrap quite often. That's why usually if you have a good RTP implementation, you will maintain a 64-bit counter for the time send and, and at least a 32-bit counter for the sequence number, which is only 16 bits. It will also wrap around quite quickly then. But many don't use that, so. But that's usually not so much of a security problem. Uh, but it's important that you use a random value when you start with your session, because if you're using SRTP and it makes it much easier to do plain text attacks against uh, the packets, because you know, okay, it starts, this will be zero in the packet and this will be zero, so you should use a random value. Um, one of the also important uh, headers is this uh, synchronization source that's basically a 32-bit random value that is chosen for each participant in a session. And basically this identifies the sender of the packet. I'll be getting to the SSRC uh, on, on the next slides, especially in the demonstration. Then uh, you have some optional headers that, for example, if this packet comes from some kind of conference bridge, then there might be not only one SSRC involved, but, but several participants, then they are also part of this header. But on, on usual one-to-one um, -one calls, you, ha you don't have those optional headers. You just have the 12 bytes. And when you're using a frame size of 20 milliseconds, that results in 16 kilobits of overhead, which you already have. And then you have to add your, your codec uh, bandwidth to that. Many people often forget about uh, the overhead of RTP, and it doesn't make too much difference if you're using G729 with 8 kilobits or GSM full rate with something like 12 or 13 kilobits of payload when you always have the 16 kilobits, so it doesn't make too much of a difference. Okay. Um, the, the most uh, problems arise when you're using or when you're trying to use a SIP phone behind uh, a network address translation to connect to some, some public SIP server. Um, because um, in the SIP protocol, when the session is negotiated, um, both sides just send an STP message which says, I want to receive my RTP on this IP address and port. And if the device is behind network address translation, it doesn't know the external IP address, so it puts in some internal IP address into this message. And then you have the, the typical case of one-way audio. What you send out to the SIP carrier usually go, gets through because they have an official IP address, but uh, the way back, uh, and you don't get any audio. And to work around that, uh, you can either have like a, on the router, have a, a, a SIP aware software that um, looks at the SIP packet, does packet inspection, and then sees there's an STP uh, with RTP going to this internal IP address, I will map this to my external IP address, maybe I will keep the port or use a different port, and then uh, the audio that's coming from the SIP carrier will go through to the phone on the lo local network. The other option is that the SIP carrier will do the NAT traversal for you, so basically um, it will not start sending packets before it gets the first packet from the device behind the network address translation, and then it will just reply to that. And so the outgoing RTP from the SIP phone creates a NUT binding, and the server can reply to that with a symmetrical RTP. But uh, the RTP specification uh, does not really uh, tell you that um, the RTP that you are receiving will be coming from the same IP address and port that you are sending to. But most implementations just assume that this is a fact, but 
it's it's a fact in uh, uh, the case in like 90 or 99 percent, but uh, the the RTP can come from somewhere else, and then uh, we run into problems. Um, most um, uh, implementations think. Uh, we choose the RTP port on that we receive the audio randomly and we use a port range of like 10,000 or 20,000 ports and it's, it's very unlikely that you might hit one of the active ports if we are only like pushing four or five channels. So usually uh, nothing bad happens unless you are in a scenario where you have a lot of calls on a single machine and uh, that's how we get the idea of, of how this worked, because a customer had uh, people complaining that they heard a second call in their RTP session. Of course, the audio was a bit uh, messed up and chopped up, but they, they heard a second call, and that was due to some uh, messed up uh, software phones, like I think it was some old version of SJ phone running on Windows, which just didn't stop sending RTP after a call was gone. So it just sends the audio from the microphone and well, if you have uh, 2,000 users on that PBX and you have only a port range of 10,000 ports, half of the ports go away for RTCP, so you're left with 5,000 ports, and then it happens that you will get distorted audio. And that's how I got the idea um, to, to look a bit at the implementation of asterisk, of course, because that's what I'm doing from day to day. And I wanted to know how does this NAT traversal on the remote side work? So uh, I looked at it and basically um, when an RTP packet is received on a port and there is an active RTP session, the NSS will just uh, override the return address for that session with the address that the packet originated from. And it, it really doesn't check the packet very well. So you can even send RTP packets that don't con contain any payload. So you just send the 12-byte header, and you send them like very often, every two to 10 milliseconds. So you make sure that you will override the return address, because the original uh, RTP peer will only send every 20 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds one packet. And then you can make sure that you will get the, the answer from the other side. And this doesn't take very much bandwidth because you're just sending 12 bytes. You can easily scan a, a complete range of a server. Usually you know that the port range, the standard is uh, 10 to 20,000, but you can also scan from 1 to 65,000. Uh, 65, yeah, it's, it doesn't take much time or much bandwidth. And it's not easily detectable because, well, it just looks like RTP. And nobody is usually looking for that. When they have some, some audio problems, they're usually looking for congested links or somebody sending lots of, of data to some port. So it's quite easy to hide that you're scanning this. And I've made a very uh, simple and uh, crappy program in C, which just takes that port range and starts scanning and outputs, OK, I got a response. And afterwards, then you can get to the fun of yeah, doing denial of service or some, some other nice things with it. Um, and of course, you also uh, receive uh, the RTP from one of the parties. And then you can look at this uh, SSRC, the synchronization source identifier. Um, and also, you can then say, OK, I get RTP on port. 10,000, so I will get RTCP on port 10,001. You start sending the same packets, you get the RTCP, and RTCP uh, is used, for example, um, to tell the sender of an RTP session, okay, I'm receiving you with jitter X and dropouts of whatever and, and that latency, and this um, receiver report that the other party is sending contains the synchronization source of the original stream. So then I can look at my RTP ports, get the RTCP, and then I see, OK, this RTP port is talking to this other RTP port. And then I, I have the, the conversations mapped one to one. And uh, if I really want to put up some effort and have a good network connection, 
um, then I can just, if I use a very good timing, then I can play man in the middle, because I will send packets without payload to override the return address, and when some real packet is coming, I will get that packet, send it to the other session, and if no packet is coming, I will just also send those packets without payload, and basically this way I can be man in the middle, but I'm on the public internet. And especially with asterisk, there is no option to bind the RTP to a certain IP address. So it binds to 0.0.0.0. .0 and uh, that way uh, you have, for example, two phones in your local network. You have your asterisk server that's connected to the internet because you're using a SIP provider. And somebody else from outside the internet can see that there are two phones talking on the internal network and he can be man in the middle from remote. And that's quite fun, but I was too lazy to actually implement that. So we'll have a, a few uh, more simple demonstrations, but uh, they show what you can do, and then maybe you can do this uh, as your homework to, to implement something like that. What I'm demonstrating is uh, I have an embedded system here, some x86 PC engines box with three network interfaces. Two of them are bridged together as a local network, and the third one is basically the internet connection. Now it just has a static IP address connected to my netbook, and it's running uh, the recent uh, 1.6.216 RC1 version of, of Asterisk, the stable 1.6 branch, and it's, uh, it's just configured so I can make calls between the two phones. Um, and I'm actually, I'm remote. It's not like we're doing something like ARP cache poisoning and then getting to the RTP on the local network. That's like uh, maybe 10 years ago. And that's very easy. Just turn the switch into the hub and then do man in the middle or whatever. Okay, so now I'll try to switch my terminal. I can't see it here on my netbook, so this might get a little tricky. But at first I will SSH into my asterisk. 10, 0, 0, 1. Okay. I haven't started it yet, so I will start asterisk. And then there's something strange with the colors. In version 1.6 and version 1.8. Then see if my SIP phones have registered. Probably not yet, because asterisk was not started. So we might need to reboot the phones, but that's no problem. And the external network is this 10001, and internal I have 192.168.192.1. Uh, and the phones register to this internal network, and I'm looking at it from the outside. So they need a bit of reboot time, but that should be fine. Yes, I'm not very creative with giving names to software, which you, if you know me, you might know that I do stuff quite a lot. Put in the IP address, and um, to speed up the demonstration, I have limited the RTP port range from 10,000 to 12,000, but you could easily implement this and send uh, lots of packets in parallel, but I'm lazy, and so we'll stick with 10 to 12,000. Okay, a bit difficult if you can't see it. <laughs> the phones still are booting, so if you got any questions in between, just... Um, the, the question was what phone I was using. It's a SNOM 300 zip phone, just because they are not so big, so I could easily fit them into my bag. But it's just a standard zip phone. One. One. One of them registered yet? Not registered, which is a bit strange. This one is registered. Okay, the other one is registered too. Um, of course, uh, to make this work, we have to enable net traversal, 
which you normally wouldn't need in the local network, but uh, a few people uh, quite like to take their phone home or use it remotely, or they have a central Azure server somewhere in the data center and then just connect the phone from some, some ADSL line. So a very typical um, configuration is in zip.conf to enable, um, make it register dynamically, and then also um, don't allow re-invites because this will not work with NAT, and also do not allow to uh, set up direct media between the phones, also doesn't work. And of course, NAT equals yes, uh, so you turn on the NAT traversal. Okay, then I'll make a phone from a phone call from 100 to 101. Okay, should produce some nice feedback. Okay, I put that to the side. Now the call is running, and then from my netbook, I will just now start scanning the port range. Hopefully, yeah, we already found one session. It should be enough. Um, the first thing I will be demonstrating is just plain uh, denial of service. Um, basically, the program I'm using is uh, sending lots of, of packets with an actual payload of a G711, 160 octets, and this will be forwarded to the other phone. But also, I'm overwriting this return address constantly, so the answer from that phone is, is going to me. So there is not one-way audio, there is no-way audio. Do this just with RTP, gem, uh, at the internet address and port. What was it? 10, 10 3 to 6. I think there was some. 3 to 6, yeah, okay. That's difficult. Okay, we turn on the speakerphone again. And we'll have some feedback there. And now we don't have any feedback anymore. And if I stop it, whoo, then we will have nice feedback and no feedback. So this is a denial of service, service which is quite easy and can be quite effective because you know just what port you have to, to send packets to to, well, not make them do any phone calls anymore. It doesn't work perfectly. You sometimes hear the feedback because, uh, well, the program is uh, just a proof of proof of concept, so that's not important. And now we like to uh, do something else. Um, a lot of people, uh, when they're using Asterisk, also allow calls to be transferred using DTMF. This is quite useful, for example, if you forward calls to your mobile, then you're able to just press uh, star or pound and then an internal extension to redirect the call in your PBX, which is usually not that easy with a mobile. I've also set this up, and now I will just inject DTMFs to that port Three, two, six. We want to send DTMF, and for example, we can I turn on the speaker and we send a one. Don't hear that, but I think is it the right port? Okay, now I've sent the pound sign, and I can transfer the call. Okay, I'll do that again, and then I transfer it to extension nine which could basically be my 0900 number registered in somewhere in Africa where I get my kickback to, well, just what the guys did in, uh, I think, Romania. They got caught a few weeks ago with 11 million euros of, of damage, and that's uh, pretty easy to do then. Okay, and um, to do the man in the middle, you really have to have a good internet connection to that Astro server, because if you have uh, lots of jitter and packet loss, and it will be quite different, uh, difficult to produce this correct timing to always override that, that address. Uh, well, that's so much for the demonstration. Of course, you can think of 
strange other things <laughs> that you could do. You could send like um, uh, like a fax stone to to trigger a T thirty eight reinvite or something like that. Or yeah, just send some audio to some annoying message that this call is uh, whatever interrupted and. Um, you can make up some business model with that, I'm pretty sure. And also, it's uh, the, the most, uh, the nastiest way is, is just to disrupt some calls a little bit of your competing SIP carrier or whatever. You just make, make it a, a crappy quality and then, well, you might win some customers. Okay? And that's what I've just been. Uh, demonstrating. You can think of different other creative ways to do this. If you want to do men in the middle attacks, just do it. It's very easy. Uh, no, it doesn't. I've tested it also with, with, with other things. And let's go to this one. For example, I mainly tested this with all versions of asterisk. And I also tested RTP proxy with the recent version 1.2.1, which is quite common, used by people using open SIPs uh, together with an RTP proxy. And what I found is a bit more strange than asterisk. Um, when, I was send, when I was scanning the port range of RTP proxy, um, I sent one packet, I, I hit the RTP session, and from then on, I got all the RTP. And it didn't recover unless you would do a reinvite on the SIP phones, and afterwards it was not possible anymore to redirect the RTP. So somebody should take a look there and, and do something about it. And I've also done some, let's say, research on the public internet and found people using RTP proxy, and they sent me like a few hundred megabytes of RTP, probably some test calls that have been set up, and um, yeah, it, Take some 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 effort to work against it. We have also tested like regular SIP phones. So when you have a SIP phone, it's not possible to find the, the port on which RTP is running. But I was interested to see if if it's possible to de to do a denial of service against a SIP phone when you know the port, because um, actually you could do some validation of the RTP stream coming in. At first, uh, you look at the version number. Is it two? Then you look at the sequence number. Is it increasing by one with every packet? Is the timestamp increasing by 160 if you're running G711? And uh, is it coming from a different IP address all the time? Uh, but they don't. So basically, with every SIP phone, you can, in my um, test program, I'm actually sending with every packet a random sequence number and the random timestamp, which should never make a valid RTP stream. Or they can just. I can use it to, to disable the audio on, on SNOM SIP phones, on, probably on Cisco. I tested this on Linksys ATAs. And it really isn't that important for a phone to do it, because it's not that easy to, to find the port, unless you limit the RTP port range of the phone to like four ports, because you want to forward it through your firewall or something like that. And then it gets a bit difficult. No, I want to go back. So I thought about a few ways, uh, what can we do? Actually, with asterisk, there is a way. You can just configure a strict RTP equals yes in rtp.conf, which is disabled by default, um, probably because people are afraid of one-way audio um, scenarios, which can happen when, when you enable that option. And what it does, it basically um, limits the, the time frame where you can overwrite the return address of the session to the first few packets of that session. And this can create problems. Uh, for example, if you have an external music on hold server and you're not really re-inviting the session uh, to make sure that the audio is coming from that music on hold server, then you won't get that music on hold, for example. I also think this is the main reason why the SIP phones uh, basically take RTP from anybody because it's convenient to have some, some sort of music on hold server, and then you just say, OK, send to that phone, to that port, and then it will render the music on hold. But um, actually, it's not the best idea. So with asterisk 1.6 and 1.8, you can just enable that option. 
But then you would have to, to check if everything works with uh, calling over SIP carriers over the internet. And I think they didn't want to have too much trouble, so they added the option, but it's disabled by default. For the older versions of Asterisk, there is no solution. You can just not use NAT traversal with it. So one thing would be to use a VPN to get rid of NAT. Even some of the bigger SNOM phones have a firmware which includes OpenVPN, which also gives you like good encryption, which Asterisk doesn't have until Asterisk 1.8, because it doesn't support SRTP. And of course, you could say, OK, why not use SRTP? Because then it's encrypted, and then I can make sure that I can decrypt it, and it's coming from the correct source. And I tried this uh, some weeks ago with Asterisk 1.8.0. It might have changed by now, but I sent up an, an SRTP call between two phones that got net traversal on the Asterisk, and then it just needed a single packet to one of those ports, and Asterisk would say, this is not the SRTP that I'm expecting, and it hangs up the call completely, which is, well, nice. So um, the other nice thing which you could do and which um, mainly uh, corporations do is have a, a firewall that is SIP aware and does a SIP packet inspection, and then it will just open those ports to the internet <laughs> where they will be expecting RTP from a SIP carrier. But this, uh, this works, but uh, with some firewalls, it can happen that the firewall um, SIP inspection isn't that good to detect that uh, uh, the call is over, and it will just leave the port open. And then if you make like a few thousand calls with random ports all the time, at some point of time, you will have the complete port range open, and well, it just buys you time. Maybe you should restart the firewall every day, and then you're fine, sort of. Yeah, and if you want to get into the implementation, then it gets, uh, well, there are things you can do. Just do not uh, accept packets from, from a new IP address when nobody told you so. Um, usually, you would accept packets coming from somebody else when there was uh, a re-invite to the session or when something changed, but this, uh, of course, uh, makes uh, the implementation a bit more complicated. And uh, for example, in Asterisk, the RTP support is like really old. And nobody, also nobody uh, looks at like the RTP level of voice of IP. Most people uh, deal with SIP and, and try to make that secure, or they look at maybe SRTP and key exchanges and stuff. But uh, the old stuff which is there, not many people look at it and then, uh, well, it creates a few problems. Uh, OK. So if you have any equipment to test, like uh, some, some non-open source um, uh, RTP proxy uh, that you want to test, just drop me a line. Maybe I should have written my email address somewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, just if you want to get in touch with me, um, you can, oops. Just send, send an email to kpiot at googlemail.com, and I will also uh, upload the, the slides to the uh, uh, Pentabuff system, and then you also include the email address there if you have something that wants you to test. And yeah, if you've got questions, then. Hi, I did a presentation about similar topics yesterday, um, and the situation seems to be worse than I expected. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's good fact, opportunities. I, pardon? Good opportunities. It's yes. Worse. I, I did similar tests a, few, a couple of years ago with a, a closed source back-to-back -back user agent, and it really fixed the the mapping from IP address and port number, you could only, you have to be the first one who sent the RTP packet to yep. get the traffic redirected, which is a very short time frame. You have to know when somebody calls and it's not yep. so easy. Um, That's sufficient to, to fix it, I think. We are currently introducing new back-to-back -back user. I, don't, I think I had, have to do some more testing here. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. It's, it's, yes. Send some, some small UDP packets. Yeah. And... But 
Oh, I'm impressed. <laughs> it's really worse than I thought. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Uh, yes, somebody. Yeah, we have another question. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't hear, but is your code, uh, your RTP jam and DTMF jam available online anywhere? Uh, no, and it probably won't because it's very messy, but uh, you just have to, to send those very simple packets every few milliseconds, and that should be, should, should be doable, and if you're not capable of doing that, you shouldn't be doing it, because you can cause uh, quite some audio problems out there. Any more questions? So I guess uh, uh, let's thank the speaker again and, and we'll call it a day. So this